chapter two and last time we really started talking about uh the idea of electrons and <clears throat> the idea of sort of the change of electrons from one energy level to the next and as they move from one energy level to the next they either got to absorb some energy to do so so if that electron finds itself going to a higher energy level that's an endothermic process where basically energy is being absorbed to allow that electron to transition upwards uh, we also have electrons in higher energy level which frankly in chemistry higher energy levels are things where um, people do not want to be so the most stable sort of way for most things is a lower state of energy so these excited electrons will work their way back down to sort of a lower state of energy and a reminder that in order to do so conservation of energy tells us they have to in this case give off some energy in the form of a photon of light and this is sort of an exothermic process where energy is being given off now if that light that's coming off corresponds to a wavelength for example in the visible part of the spectrum uh, we'll see some colors like our red orange yellow green blue indigo and violet again it doesn't always have to sort of correspond to a visible part of the spectrum it could correspond to maybe outside of that. So anywhere on that electromagnetic spectrum we looked at the other day, you know, where we have radio waves, infrared, UV rays, visible rays and so forth, you know, it really could come off. Uh, obviously if it comes out outside of the visible part of the spectrum, we really won't see uh, sort of the color associated with it. Now, when we have elements, uh, they really transition from one energy level to the next in what is sometimes referred to as quantized energy. And quantized energy is thought of as being sort of packets of energy, if you will. And basically what that means is, as we talked about a little bit, you could think of it as like stairs. So we are either on sort of this step, we're on that step, we're on that step. Again, we typically don't lay it up there in between steps or anything like that. Uh, otherwise we would fall. And it's the same idea here as electrons gain energy or lose energy they will gain energy or lose energy and these whole multiple packets of energy referred to as a quantized uh, packet of energy and <clears throat> that results in very distinct spectrums that we will see today in lab and these are what are referred to as line spectrums and elements will give off line spectrums when they're excited they are super specific, which means that you can, based on the lines that you see, the positions that you see and everything like that, uh, you can pretty much identify what element you're talking about uh, just based on the colors and sort of the wavelengths at which they come out. And that's different than sort of like the sun, which gives more of a continuous sort of spectrum. Continuous spectrum, pretty much everything's sort of coming off all at once. So we again can relate that to more like walking up again a ramp or, and if you walk up a ramp, again, you can really lay it up anywhere there along the way. And <clears throat> you can have all things coming off at once. Now, we saw some important equations that allows us to calculate certain things. And there is a sort of a relationship in terms of waves, for example. The shorter the wavelength, the higher the frequency. And that usually results in a higher energy. And vice versa to that would be the longer the wavelength usually the lower the frequency and usually that thing is lower in energy we can use uh, c is equal to the wavelength times the frequency and c which is the speed of light which is three times 10 to the eight meters per second this is our wavelength which is usually in units of meters and that is our frequency which is in units of reciprocal seconds so <clears throat> We also saw that you could calculate the energy associated with a wave uh, by using E is equal to H times the frequency. H is Planck's constant. And that is our 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 joules times seconds. That is our frequency in this case. And we could actually pull those two sort of equations together 
and we could use it to solve for energy if we only know really the wavelength that's happening here. So, so E would equal H times the frequency. And since the frequency is the speed of light over the wavelength, this allows us to really tie those two equations together. It allows you to figure out the energy associated with a photon of light if you frankly just know the wavelength or if you know the frequency will allow you to do that. You do gotta watch units. Obviously, when you use these equations here, C is the speed of light, which is meters per second. And you wanna make sure that the wavelength obviously is in meters when you use this. Otherwise, again, you will be off by a factor. Sometimes wavelengths are given in nanometers, maybe centimeters occasionally. So you wanna watch those things. We were talking about sort of the Bohr's model of the atom kind of right in the middle here. And the idea of Bohr's model of the atom, which really explains very nicely what we see in terms of the, the lights and the colors that we see, the lines, I guess is what I was trying to spit up there, the lines and the colors that we see in the hydrogen atom. But it does sort of fall apart as we move away from one electron. But the idea of Bohr's model is sort of this idea of the planetary model where we have a nucleus and then we basically have these orbits and electrons are really moving around sort of in these circular orbits. As we'll later talk about that is not really true and how it works, um, but uh, he called the different orbits have different energy levels. So for example, N equals one is the ground state. That is the lowest in energy, the most stable. Anything above N equals one is equal to joules times seconds. So joules is a unit of energy and S is obviously seconds, which is time. So N equals one is the ground state. Again, is that energy level is really the closest to the nucleus. Uh, anything above that is considered an excited state, a higher energy state, and it is further away from the nucleus. The idea of this is the quantized idea. What we see in terms of colors that come off in the hydrogen spectrum is a result of say an electron jumping from one energy level to the next. Again, being able to gain or lose energy in enough to make that transition from one to the next. We'll never find an electron kind of hanging out in between two energy levels. They will gain enough to do that. We closed with talking about the idea that you can actually calculate the energy associated with that transition as, for example, an electron in the hydrogen atom sort of goes from one energy level to the next. And that equation was this guy that we saw at the very end, the change in energy is equal to minus 2.18 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. This is what is sometimes referred to as Rydberg's constant. And one over n squared final minus one over n squared initial. And we have our final initial states, basically energy levels for those guys. This is going to be tied together with the equation actually over here. So I'll just make a big equal. Basically it will equal everybody to the left there. So you could actually calculate the energy associated with that transition. And you could use that energy to calculate something like the wavelength of light that would be associated that either had to be absorbed or being given off or even the frequency of that light. Yes, sir. Yeah, you could use this. Uh, no, so that's the N is the energy level. It's a principal quantum number. So it's basically the energy level where the electron either started or ended, basically. It's transition is what you use. No, so this is the uh, equation that you can use for electrons as they're transferring from one spot to the next. There is one like in the lab, which uh, corresponds to the energy level just with an electron sitting on that energy level without transitioning, which I think is the one you're talking about that has the atomic number associated with it. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, so let's continue on with this here. Uh, so we were talking about, like I said, Bohr's model of the atom which again, really sort of falls apart as we move away from hydrogen. Uh, but again, it really does explain the lines that we see, uh, those electrons to transition. 
And as the electron moves around in these orbits, again, they're restricted to either be in one orbit or energy level or move from one to the next. And as the electrons are brought closer to the nucleus, energy is released from the system. So the only way to bring electrons closer to the nucleus is they got to drop energy levels, right? And again, that energy has got to go somewhere. So in reference to the atom, it would be given off that energy, right? Obviously, if the atom gained energy, like the other day when we stuck the, uh, the wire into the uh, Bunsen burner, gained a lot of energy, right? The electrons would obviously go up in energy. <clears throat> So Bohr's model of the atom, as I mentioned, is kind of incorrect. It, it really, you know, kind of really sticks really well for hydrogens. And electrons do not move around the nucleus in an orbital sort of fashion, um, or an orbit sort of fashion. As we'll talk about later in this chapter, really, there's no good way to know exactly how a particle like an electron is moving. And the more you sort of know how it's moving, the less you know sort of about its location at that point, that's what's known as Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Basically, electrons move pretty much randomly about the nucleus. Is there an attraction to the nucleus? There is. Again, as we talked about, electrons obviously negatively charged. So there is that attraction to the nucleus, which is positively charged. So they are sort of held in a sense like that, which is why they could also exhibit sort of wave-like functions. So they're kind of held like a string on a guitar, right? Kind of to the nucleus, but they could kind of move around about the uh, nucleus in more of a wave-like pattern. So as we'll talk about, we will move away from this idea of orbits to the idea of electrons really uh, moving around in that empty space in a more uh, quantum mechanical model. Well, let's do a little calculations here and make sure our calculators work. What color of light is emitted when an excited electron in hydrogen falls from first uh, the fifth to the second energy level, the fourth to the second, and then the third to the second? Let us do a whole bunch of stuff here just to make sure. Let us calculate the change in energy. Let us actually calculate the wavelength, obviously. And let's talk about the wavelength in nanometers. And why don't we calculate the frequency as well? This would be a nice warm up for lab. We'll do all those calculations. So take some time here, work through each of those individually, calculate those guys. One reminder as well nano is 10 to the minus nine. Yeah. <clears throat> So we're looking for three things for each of these, the energy, the wavelength, and the frequency for each of these transitions. Okay, let's take a look, see how you're doing. So these are some important calculations, which you will be doing later today, a bunch of these. So let's talk about some, again, the uh, formulas that definitely we should think about as we're doing this. Since we're looking for energy, change in energy, we're looking for wavelength, and we're looking for frequency. Obviously here, uh, we have some transitions from one energy level to the next. So we do want to use our change in energy is equal to minus our Rydberg constant. Again, one over n squared uh, final, which is our final energy level, not equals minus one over n squared initial, uh, which would be our initial energy level. We obviously could use that since that's really the only information given to us to get to the change in energy that's going to occur as these electrons transition from one energy level to the next. We also are looking for wavelength and frequency. So we could tie into that E is equal to H times the frequency. So once we have the energy, H is Planck's constant, that will allow us to get to frequency. Uh, we could also use hc over the wavelength which then we if we want to do the wavelength first we could actually do that as well since h and c are both constants so we could roll that way and if we had the frequency or the wavelength uh, we could even roll with our original equation there and figure out the opposite one you know so if you got wavelength first or frequency first you can then roll into uh, the one with the speed of light there to calculate so there's a few different sort of ways you could go after you get the energy sort of value there um, just depending on your approach and which one you like if you do them correctly they all should get you to the same spot i guess that's the important part of everything right doing it correctly so let's take a look at the first one here we're going to roll a 
So in A here, we are rolling from uh, N is equal to five to N is equal to two, I believe. So once again, that's all we need to go right into that Ryberg sort of equation. So the change in energy here will be our minus 2.18 times 10 to the minus 18. Like I said before, I, I like the rounded number. It's way too many digits, the other one. We're gonna take one over our final squared. So one over two squared should be one over four minus our initial there, which would be one over five squared, which is gonna give us a 25. We wanna do what's in the parentheses there first. So one divided by four uh, minus one divided by 25, maybe hit in equals, times it by uh, 2.18 to the minus 18. It's gonna yield us like a, uh, we'll call it, 4.58 to the minus 19 as I erase it, I think. Uh, minus 4.58 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. Here would be our answer. Any questions on that one there? <clears throat> Everybody got that number? That's good because I hit clear and I hope that was the number I saw. By the way, does this make sense based on what the electron is doing? Electron is going from the fifth energy level to the second energy level, is that an endothermic process or an exothermic process? It is exothermic, it has to give off that energy, which means we should see a negative number here. And a negative energy value indicates an exothermic process, so that does make sense. If the electron was transitioning the opposite way, going from two to five, the energy number would be the exact same energy, right? It's that quantized idea, but it would only be positive in that case, right? So basically the stuff in the parentheses will switch. That will switch the sign, but the amount of energy will be the same regardless of which way they're going. But we do want to keep the sign. And the sign is really, really important when you are stating the energy because it will tell you if it's exothermic or endothermic. So you don't want to dump the negative or anything like that. With that being said, now we want to dump the negative because we are going to calculate the wavelength and the frequency. And frankly, you should never ever have a negative wavelength or negative frequency. So it's important to keep the sign for the energy value, but you do need to sort of get rid of it uh, when you go through and calculate the wavelength and the frequency. So you don't end up with a negative value for those guys. So at this point, what I'm going to roll with is I'm going to go uh, frequency first. So I could do that by simply taking E is equal to H times the frequency. In this case, then the frequency uh, would equal E divided by H, right? As I bring that to that side. <clears throat> My energy value here, once again, I'm going to get rid of the negative sign. So I do not end up with a negative value going to divide it by Planck's constant, which is a constant value of 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 joules times seconds. So I'm going to put that in my calculator, making sure I use my exponent button like they intended, 4.58 exponent negative 19, uh, divided by 6.63 exponent negative 34. Going to give me Something. We'll call it 6.91 to the positive 14. 6.91 times 10 to the 14. What are the units here? They are actually reciprocal seconds. So this cancels, this cancels, that's on top. So when you divide, you end up with reciprocal seconds, which is also the same thing again as a Hertz. So a Hertz and a reciprocal second are the same. Any questions on that one there? Yeah. Why, why that? that? That was a question. Is that what you're asking? Why, why are they five and two? Is that what you're asking? That, that was just the question that they asked. So basically in this first question, they were asking the electron go from fifth energy level to the second. So, yeah. It's not negative anymore because uh, we, we really don't have negative wavelengths or negative frequencies. So the only place really where you wanna make sure you keep the negative 
is with the energy value. Because when you state a negative energy, it tells people that this process overall is exothermic. Energy is being given off in this process, which is exactly what has to happen as that electron drops down to a lower energy level. The atom has got to give off that energy to allow it to do so. Just like if we were going the opposite way and it went from two to five, you should end up with a positive value for energy because the atom would have to pick up that energy to allow the electron basically to jump up. Other questions? All right, so again, at this point, I got a few different ways I could roll to my wavelength. I'm just gonna roll at this point and use all my equations because you know I feel bad if I leave anybody out. So that is C is equal to the wavelength times the frequency, which obviously I could do now that I have the frequency. I'm gonna solve for the wavelength here, uh, which would be C divided by the frequency. So C is the speed of light, which is three times 10 to the eight meters per second divided by our 6.91 times 10 to the 14 reciprocal seconds. By the way, you could also write reciprocal seconds like that if you like. So take my calculator here, do uh, three to the eight divided by 6.91, 14 looks like. Gonna give me a 4.34. times 10 to the minus seven. Units here, seconds on top and seconds there on the bottom are actually gonna cancel. These are actually units of meters. So that would be the wavelength in meters at this point. It is, yeah. <clears throat> so at this point, we do want nanometers because we're talking about visible light, which is usually given in nanometers. So once again, to remind yourself not to screw up, your name, not to screw up. Yeah, no, here, there we go. Which is 10 to the minus nine. It is Thursday, right? All right, so that's good. Uh, when we see that, what that means is in one of the prefix unit, nanometers, there is 10 to the minus nine meters and not the other way around where most people screw it up. By the way, that is one times 10 to the minus nine if you need to put it in your calculator that way. So we'll take this and finish out that conversion. 4.34 times 10 to the minus seven meters to get rid of it, a little dimensional analysis action, 10 to the minus nine meters on the bottom and nanometer up on top. Those are gonna cancel. So we're basically taking that, dividing it by one times 10 to the minus nine, gonna yield us like a 434 nanometers, which is roughly a little blue light action, I think. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> you 100% need to know how to do this in like an hour. Yeah, so you need to know how to do it in an hour, basically, right? <laughs> any questions on any of those parts there? All right, we got a couple more to go through just to make sure. So we'll take the next transition. So on the next one, we're looking at an electron going forth from the fourth energy level to the second energy level. So let's do that one. <clears throat> What's that? It was uh, 434 nanometers, yeah. And that corresponds to approximately blue light. Okay, so in this case, we're gonna roll the same way because frankly, that's all we could start with is that Rydberg's equation there. Uh, so we're gonna go with our change in energy once again being minus 2.18 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. Once again, our final spot there is the second energy level. So we're going to square that. We're going to take one over it, which would get us a four minus our initial, which once again, we're going to square it as well, gets us a one over a 16 action there. And here, one divided by four minus uh, one divided by 16 times 2.18. Minus 18, once again, if you are not using your exponent button, you are gonna be in a world of hurt here on these calculations, yes? So 4.09 times 10 to the minus 19. And once again, this is going to be negative. <clears throat> Any questions on that one? Yeah. 
it will always be negative if your electron started obviously in a higher energy level to a lower. Only way for it to drop is the atom's got to give off that energy, which will always make it exothermic and negative. Vice versa, if your electron started lower and went up, it will always end up a positive value because it has to be endothermic. The atom's got to gain that energy to rise it up again, like when you stuck that thing in the Bunsen burner the other day, it gained a lot of energy. That's all endothermic. When we see the colors coming back out, exothermic as it's releasing it and it's giving off that energy. Other questions? What's that? No, but you're just going to do a thousand of these calculations in the lab, basically. Yeah. So you'll be professionals, I'm sure. All right, at this point, we're going to mix it up to keep things fresh here. So I'm going to go for wavelength next. Because, well, you know, I could do that, I suppose. So we could use the energy is equal to HC over the wavelength if you prefer this move first. That would mean if I rearrange this correctly, my wavelength would equal HC over the energy. And H and C are both constants. So obviously, we always have those numbers. So that's going to be our Planck's constant. That's going to be our speed of light. And we're going to divide by our energy, which once again, we're going to turn into a positive number here. So we do not yield a negative wavelength. So once again, this does make sense in terms of energy. It's exothermic because it's dropping. We do want to kind of ditch it here for the rest of the calculation so we don't get a negative number. Uh, so we're going to do a little 6.63 action, negative 34 times three to the eight, a little dividing of 4.09 uh, to the negative 19. It's gonna get us a uh, something there, 4.86 times 10 to the minus seven. Once again, unit wise, joules will cancel, seconds will cancel. That leaves us meters as the lone unit that is standing. Once again, we're going to do our conversion from meters to nanometers. And that is our 10 to the minus nine meters is a nanometer. Meters will cancel. Going to yield us a 486 nanometers as our wavelength. <clears throat> Any questions on that one there? In case you're curious, a little green action probably on that one. <laughs> At this point, we now have the wavelength, I also have the energy. So once again, we can do frequency either way. We can do it just like we did it before. We could go E is equal to H times the frequency. We could also use, again, you do have options. You could use either one of these at this point, again, to get you the frequency because you have all that information. So we'll roll into this one here. 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 joules times seconds times, uh, not really times, actually, I need to rearrange that. If we are solving for frequency, which means I actually have to erase the whole thing there. Let's try it again. We rate did uh, wavelength. All right, so we're going to do frequency here. So let's rearrange that there. So frequency in this case, once again, will be E over H. So we're going to go with uh, 4.09 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. Once again, we're getting rid of the negative and our H value here. Once again, the joules will cancel, gonna leave us reciprocal seconds. And in this case, we will end up uh, with Looks like uh, 617 to the 14, 6.17 times 10 to the 14. Once again, reciprocal seconds. You should yield the exact same answer if you chose to use that equation. Yeah, you either want to rest or S to the minus one, or you could, you could write Hertz if you want. Yeah, same thing. Other questions? <clears throat> yeah. It was for the energy, but again, once you move away from the energy calculation, you should never ever have a negative wavelength or frequency. So you've got to get rid of that negative for the sake of the calculation. Again, it's uh, 
going to yield you the same answer if you left a negative in there, except you would have a negative wavelength or frequency, which you really shouldn't have. Yeah. Yes. It'd be wrong. Yeah. I'll throw your exam in the trash. Uh, there it is. Okay, I'll rip it up first and then I'll throw it in the trash. <laughs> okay. Other questions? Yeah, so again, never put a negative wavelength or frequency on it. All right, any questions on any of those three on that one? All right, last one to make sure here we're on the same page. We're going uh, three to two. All right, so uh, we'll start like we started the others there. Hopefully you should be old hat at this point. Going to use our right birch constant. Uh, we're going to go again one over our final squared, which will give us one over four minus one over nine, which would be three squared. And starting with the parentheses here. Negative uh, 3.03 .03 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. Again, does make sense based on which way the electron is traveling. Exothermic here, negatively charged. So at this point, uh, we will go uh, frequency here. E is equal to H times frequency. Once again, the frequency would be E divided by H. Dumping our negative sign like we did on the previous one and putting in our values here. We got uh, 4.57 to the 14. Once again, this is gonna get us reciprocal seconds happening. Any questions on that one there? And I'll finish it up using C is equal to the wavelength times frequency. So here the wavelength would equal C divided by the frequency. And that would give me three times 10 to the eight meters per second divided by our frequency, which was 4.57 times 10 to the 14 reciprocal seconds. <clears throat> Gets us a uh, kind of a 6.56, looks like. Times 10 to the minus seven. Once again, the seconds cancel. We're left with meters. Doing our conversion to nanometers, 10 to the minus nine meters is one nanometer. That is gonna give us approximately 656 nanometers. It's kind of the color I wrote there, red, orangey type of color that's happening in that case. Any questions on any of those calculations? 100% <clears throat> you need to know how to do those. Yes. Um, you need to be able to figure out wavelength, frequency, energy, exothermic, endothermic. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> yeah. What's that? Yeah, so let's take a look at that. So we got uh, we got in terms of wavelength here, we got a 656 on that one, right? On the previous one there, we had a 486. So that 656 looks like it's a winner on that one. And we have a 434, which is the smallest wavelength. So the longest wavelength here would be the last one which does correspond to what we talked about. That is reddish, orangey area, right? Of the visible part of the spectrum, longer wavelength. Should it have higher or lower energy, that one, last one? It should have lower energy. If we look at the energy value here of 434, which was the shortest, this guy should have the highest energy. This guy's got 458, basically. And our guy over here has 303. So we do see in terms of energy, 
our red has less energy, right, associated with that than our smallest one, which was the 434, I think, has the higher energy. Yeah, so the relationship is shorter wavelength, means you have a higher frequency, occurs a lot more often. That packs a bigger punch there in terms of energy, should have the higher energy. Longer drawn out wavelength will occur at a lower frequency. And like something coming a long distance away, you can see it coming, might not hurt as much maybe, right? As somebody just quickly hits you. So something very short and fast, right? Is going to have a little bit more energy than something that's sort of drawn out and kind of moving uh, with a longer wavelength. And that's what we do see when we actually look at the numbers here. <clears throat> Any questions on any of there? All right, so make sure you know how to do that for sure. If not, you'll get plenty of practice there coming up shortly. All right, that it would be C then. All right, so another important sort of aspect of sort of moving us a little bit away from this idea of Bohr's model of the atom and this planetary model of the atom uh, was one done by de Broglie. Uh, de Broglie actually didn't do any experiments. He just like thought about it and wrote about it. And he was actually right when other people did experiments. Uh, but the de Broglie uh, wavelength basically proposed that that dual nature, that particles like electrons, for example, can have wave-like functions. Uh, and just like waves could have particle-like functions as well. Uh, because it's really small, the wave character of electrons uh, is going to be significant. And that brings us to this equation here, which is uh, what is sometimes referred to as the de Broglie wavelengths. Right, what's here? And de Broglie wavelength is equal to H divided by the mass divided by the velocity. We do have to watch out on several units when we use this one here. Sort of the idea here as well is the idea, like I was mentioning before, like a guitar string, right? So if you pluck a guitar string, you're going to have the wave, kind of like a standing wave happening, right? You'll have points where there's no amplitude, which are sometimes referred to as nodes. Uh, but really, the guitar string and the wave is tied to the guitar, right? Your string doesn't, and the wave doesn't go off. And it's sort of the same idea as I was mentioning earlier. We have these electrons that are moving about really randomly, but you know, there is sort of a tiredness to the nucleus because of the opposites of charge. So although they are moving around sort of randomly, they do possess sort of this wave character because they're basically stuck to the atom, if you will, uh, by its by its nucleus. So here we have the Planck's constant, and there's a really important relationship in units, which is a joule is equal to a kilogram meter squared divided by second squared. So if something has the unit of joules, that's equivalent to being kilogram meter squared second squared. And that's important when we do a couple bits of these calculations here. If we use this calculation, we do need to make sure that the mass is not in grams, but actually is in kilograms, so everything cancels out correctly. The other important part is the velocity. So if there's any other unit than meters per second, we also need to convert that to meters per second. Otherwise, once again, the units will really not work out uh, really well. If we look just at the units, what's in the parentheses here is a joule. So if you remember, H is our 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 joules times seconds. So inserting in there for joules, our relationship, we could start canceling out things. The seconds cancel and one on the bottom. So that completely cancels. Uh, we do get the kilograms cancel and one of the meters cancel, which means when it's all said and done, we are left with meters as a result of this. The good news is it frankly doesn't even change Planck's constant. It's still the same number. It's just the units are different. You could leave them as joules as long as you remember to do everybody else in kilograms and meters per second. It's all going to work out the same. So the nice thing, even though this is sort of different units, the number is still the same. So that is really good here. <clears throat> so why don't we try one here? I'll give you that there. All right. 
Calculate the wavelength of an electron that's traveling at 2.65 times 10 to the six, I think that's it, uh, meters per second. The uh, <clears throat> velocity there and from the back leaf of your book, I don't know what leaf that might be. We'll use the mass of an electron as 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. Okay, let's take a look here. Um, so in this case, uh, we're looking for the uh, de Broglie wavelength, uh, which would be h over m times our velocity. In this case, and it won't always be the case, we are good in terms of units. So really just got to plug and chug into here. 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 joules times seconds divided by our 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms and our 2.65 times 10 to the six meters per second. Once again, a reminder that the joules is a kilogram meter squared, second squared. So unit wise, once again, that is how this is all gonna kind of cancel each other out, except for obviously one meter that is left at that point. So we'll go uh, 6.63 to the minus 34, divided by 9.11 to the minus 31 and divided by 2.65 to the sixth. Looks like uh, 2.75 to the minus 10. And this would be meters in this case. Large wavelength, small wavelength? Really small wavelength, yeah. High energy, low energy? have high energy, right? Because it's a small wavelength in this case, yeah. Obviously in this case, everything was in the property units, but in these type of problems, you may need to do some conversions, again, to get things in kilograms, or obviously meters per second. Any questions on that one? Yeah. <clears throat> you would not. So typically most wavelengths will be given in meters, except for usually in the visible part of the spectrum, like some colors. Those are typically given in nanometers. This is most often how they're given. Other questions? <clears throat> And truthfully, if it uh, sort of doesn't specify, then frankly, you could lay up any, any you want there, I suppose. All right. So as we've been talking, we've been basically kind of moving away from the idea of Bohr's model of the atom, which once again are these guys that are trapped in these orbits, these electrons and moving away from this, to this idea really of, you know, particles like electrons, you have this wave-like functions, and at no given point in time, there really is sort of a limitation in terms of your knowledge of exactly how an electron is moving and really its location. And as I mentioned before, this is really the idea of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which is what we see right there in the middle. Basically, the more you know about one aspect of a particle like an electron, the more you know, for example, about its location, the less you really know about how it's traveling and sort of vice versa. So that's the idea of the uncertainty part of it. Uh, we probably won't do any calculations involving this equation, but that is the equation. These are our normal characters there, our Planck's constant, obviously pi, and mv is the uncertainty in the particle's momentum, and the delta x is the uncertainty in particle's position. So we're really sort of moving away from the Bohr's model to this more quantum mechanical model. And really the best that we could kind of come up with is this idea of probability and the probability of finding an electron somewhere in the atom. Now, we don't really know how it got there. We really don't know kind of how it's moving. We just know that there are certain places within the atom that there is probably going to be a higher probability of finding an electron than in other places. So we oftentimes will see some probability maps, some density maps, and I think we'll have some pictures coming up, but you know, it kind of is like gets really dark in the middle. Then as it sort of fans out, it gets lighter color and lighter color. So usually anywhere where there's sort of a darker color, a lot of times represented by like pink or red or something like that. Uh, it's a really high probability of finding an electron in that area. And as you found out where it gets a little bit lighter and lighter on those sort of probability maps, the probability of finding an electron sort of decreases. If we had to sort of take a 
educated guess, the highest probability of finding electrons in an atom should be near what? Should be near the nucleus, right? Because again, the electrostatic attraction, the positive negative attraction between the negatively charged electrons and positively charged uh, nucleus would tell us that there's a probably a highly good chance that we should find some electrons hanging out in that area. Obviously, as we move ourselves in higher energy levels and further away from the nucleus, probability really does start to uh, sort of go down. So, and that's what we see here, almost like what I drew, if you close your eyes. Uh, but what we do see here is, I guess you kind of see it on there, much, much darker, obviously, in the center there. You can kind of visualize that probably the nucleus is hanging out there in the middle where it's really, really dark. And as we sort of fan out a little bit, uh, we have a lower probability of finding it. So what do we use for these sort of probabilities of finding electrons in an atom? We transition from the idea of orbits like we had in Bohr's model to this idea of orbitals that we kind of use in our model here. And as you may be familiar with, uh, there are S orbitals, P orbitals, D orbitals, and F orbitals, which for the most part are kind of probability maps of where you could find sort of electrons housed uh, within the atom. <clears throat> and so I think what I want to do is actually want to skip a little bit ahead in the notes, cover those orbitals, and then we'll come back to this. Give me one of these notes down the road there. So the first type of orbitals, which are again these sort of probability maps of finding electrons, are s orbitals. And s orbitals are basically found on every energy level. So remember, energy levels are the principal quantum number, which is n. And we do find s orbitals on every single energy level that there is. And as you can see here, basically an S orbital is thought of as being sort of a sphere, where as you could imagine from kind of the top picture there, and even the bottom picture there, you know, a good probability of finding that electron is going to be kind of in that center of that sphere, as you can visualize kind of the nucleus being in that kind of center part of it. They're all spheres, no matter what energy level they're on. They just get larger to kind of accommodate all the electrons that are coming into the atom and they fit into these nice little areas here. These are nodes. Nodes are places on sort of a wave-like model where there's basically no amplitude, yeah? So again, kind of the idea of like the standing wave where it's kind of tied to it and the guitar, there's areas where I pluck it, there's parts where there's no amplitude and those are nodes. Um, <clears throat> So also really important in terms of orbitals in general, as you may be aware of, any orbital, any individual orbital, can only hold two electrons. So no matter what individual orbital you may be talking about, on any energy level you like, if you just take one individual orbital by itself, the maximum number of electrons you basically could put in there is two. Then the other types of orbitals that we do come across are p orbitals. And there's actually three different types of p orbitals. There is the px, the py, and the pz orbital. They actually start showing up there on the second energy level. And px, py, and pz are really their orientation in sort of three-dimensional space, kind of like a map. There's an x, y, and z sort of coordinate. There are a guy on the x, our guy on the y, and our guy on the z orbital there. There's basically two lobes where you could kind of visualize most of the electron density kind of hanging out towards the center. You kind of visualize almost like the nucleus would be somewhere in that ballpark, and we get a lot of the sort of uh, <clears throat> probability of finding those electrons in those areas. Now, when we take three of these guys together, these are three individual orbitals. When we take all three of them together, they are sometimes referred to as a subshell or sublevel. 
And that would be, for example, the 2P subshell, which means all three of my orbitals there are together. That would mean if I filled up my 2P subshell, how many electrons could I throw in there total? It would be six, right? Each one could hold two electrons, right? Which means if you filled up that entire thing there, that's six electrons. <clears throat> You filled up an entire P subshell. Again, individually, each one could only hold two along the way. Other orbitals that we come across are uh, D orbitals. There's actually five different D orbitals. And here's the five different sort of D orbitals here. They, for the most part, look like kind of two P orbitals put together. Except for the last one, looks like a donut with a P orbital coming through the middle. These are, again, our electron density sort of mapping here and probability maps. And again, if you sort of visualize maybe where the node is here, kind of where the nucleus is, that is, again, sort of where we see a highest probability of having those electrons kind of hanging out in those particular areas as we go through it. Once again, if you took all five of these d orbitals together, that would be the five, that would be the D subshell or sublevel. All five of these guys together would be the D subshell or sublevel. That means that if I populated all five of those orbitals with electrons, my max number of electrons here would be 10 electrons, right? If we fill the entire subshell up. And lastly, we have F orbitals, and there's seven different F orbitals, once again, on different sort of axes here. And all seven of those together would once again encompass our F subshell. And obviously, if we filled up all seven of those guys together, we will max out with a maximum electron of 14 in this case. So we're moving away from a Bohr's model of orbits to these really probability maps, Schrodinger's equations. There's a good chance I'm going to find an electron somewhere as to where we will find these electrons in the atom. <clears throat> Any questions on that there? You do need to know. Uh, you do need to know how many orbitals there are in each of those, and how many total electrons. I probably am not going to ask you to kind of identify each of the individual sort of labels. You should know at least maybe the P ones are good ones to know, but it's a little crazy to get into the F. All right, so let's go back a little bit and talk strong configuration and writing electron configuration and why the orbitals are there and why we fill them up. So as we talked about, <clears throat> the orbital size is really difficult to define precisely. Do we really see like, you know, spheres and figure eights and stuff in an atom? Probably not. Um, orbitals is a wave function, which if you ever take physical chemistry, I'm sorry, but if you take physical chemistry, not a wave function, Schrodinger's equation, calculus, everybody saves it for like the last chemistry class. That way they could take it over again. Um, pictures of an orbital is uh, basically 3D dimensional. No, some people pass. Uh, hydrogen 1s orbital, the radius is a sphere. 90% of the total electron probability is found in that sphere. So let's talk a little bit about quantum numbers and what they sort of help us understand and why they help us understand is what orbitals are where in the atom on what energy level. So the first quantum number is the principal quantum number, which is N, as we've talked about. N really can have values of one through seven. As we talked about, N equals one is the ground state. So that is the lowest in energy, the most stable. And as we talked about that, pretty much N from two to seven uh, is it what I refer to as excited states. So these would be obviously energy levels that are higher in energy, further away from the nucleus. 
The next quantum number is what is referred to as the angular momentum quantum number, which is L. And for the most part, L will tell you the shape of the atomic orbital. When we talk about atomic orbitals, that is our S's, our P's, our D's, our F's. That's what atomic orbitals are. And the value of L that you get will tell you what type of orbital you are dealing with. Now, L could go from... <clears throat> L could go from zero to N minus one. So possible values of L will run from zero to N minus one, N being the principal quantum number there. The magnetic quantum number, which is M sub L, will tell you basically the orientation of those orbitals in three-dimensional space. So we just saw we had like a PX, a PY, a PZ, everybody hanging out on some different orientations there in three-dimensional space. That is what the M sub L will tell you. If you just want to think about M sub L, it will also tell you, frankly, how many orbitals there are on that particular uh, subshell. So M sub L runs from minus L to zero to positive L, all whole numbers. So whatever L value you have, it runs from negative of that value to zero to positive of that value. <clears throat> and the fourth quantum number, which is down the road somewhere on a stone slide, I'm not sure why, is the spin quantum number. And that is M sub S. And M sub S is pretty simple. It can either have a value of plus one half or minus one half sometimes referred to as plus or minus a half. It basically will tell you in that particular orbital which way your electron is spinning. Yes, electrons spin, they're affected by fields, right? So if the electron is sort of spinning in the upwards notation, it is basically plus a half, like your electron is spinning upwards. If your electron is spinning in the sort of downward notation, that is minus one half, is basically what we got going on there. <clears throat> Any questions on that there? So now what we're going to do is tie together quantum numbers, a little bit maybe of electron configuration coming up soon. But let's start with our energy level and where electrons will be in the atom. So there we go. So let's just start with the basics, which is if I am on the first energy level, which would be N equals one, that is the lowest, closest to the nucleus. That means that my L value could be what? My L value could go from zero to N minus one, which means in this case, one minus one is zero. So the only value you could have is zero. An L value of zero tells us that we are talking about our good friend, the S atomic orbital. So if you hit a zero there for an L value, you are definitely talking about the uh, S orbital. M sub L in this case goes from negative L to zero to positive L, which obviously in this case is only zero. It's the only thing you could have in this case, which would be zero which basically tells you there is just one S orbital basically hanging out there. So basically what this tells us, if we go for our spin quantum number, it could be plus or minus one half in this case. So what this tells us is, I'll draw it here maybe, on that very first energy level, the only orbital that we have there is an S orbital and its notation is a one S orbital is basically the only one that we see on the very first energy level closest to the nucleus. That energy level there and that particular orbital could hold only two electrons and it could only hold obviously one heading in the upwards direction, one heading in the negative direction. Any question on that so far? So what happens when we get to the second energy level? In this case now, N would equal two. 
possible values for L once again would go from zero to N minus one. So two minus one is one. So the two possible values you could have is a zero and one. Again, it goes from zero to N minus one. So zero would be included there. That means on this energy level, we already see that the zero represents an S orbital. The one represents our friends, the P orbitals. Okay. Now for each individual L value, you could have an M sub L value. So I'm not gonna read you the zero because the zero is gonna be that guy right there. So the zero will be exactly that, which tells us on this energy level, we have a 2s orbital present because there's L is equal to zero, M sub L equals zero, and the M sub S equals plus or minus one half. Now for our value of one here, the M sub L for one would be what numbers here? Yeah, so it's going to run from negative L to zero to positive L, which means negative L would be negative one, zero plus one. That is how many numbers? Three, and there are how many P orbitals we saw in the picture? Three, each one of those numbers represent a individual P orbital. It actually goes right in order, px, py, and the pz orbital is basically what is represented by each of those. What that tells us is we could actually add to our picture here, not one, but three different p orbitals representing the m sub l of negative one, zero, and plus one. Again, the px, py, and the pz orbital in that order. For each of these guys here and each of the orbitals, we could have an m sub s a plus or minus a half. Each could hold two electrons. And as we'll talk about, one goes up and one goes down in this case. Any questions on that there? Now let's continue on here. We get to our n equals three level, which would be our next. Our L value can once again go from zero to N minus one. So N minus one in this case would be two. So all the possible values you could have on the third energy level is a zero, a one, and a two. Obviously just like above the zero is an S, the one is a P and an L value of two represents the D orbitals in this case. So we could kind of fill in because once again, our L value of zero will once again have the same MLL values along. Our L value of one will have the same ones as above as well. So we know on this, we have a three S orbital. We also have some three P orbitals, but this is the energy level where we first start to see the appearance of D orbitals because we do have an L value here of two. Now we could again for our two, write an M sub L, which again goes from negative L to positive L. That would be a negative two, negative one, zero, plus one and plus two as possible M sub L values. Frankly, if we just count up those numbers, that's how many numbers? That's five numbers, right? And there's how many D orbitals? Five, again, each one represents an individual D orbital. And we could add that to our list here. If I have room, one, two, three, four, five, squeeze it in. And that would be our three D orbitals. Obviously our M sub S in this case would be plus or minus one half. Any questions on that there? And just to finish out here, since I got one little spot left there, We'll go with the fourth energy level, come up here. That means my L values could go from zero to N minus one. So we're gonna roll a zero, maybe a zero, a one, a two, and a three. Once again, the zero represents the S orbital. The one represents the P orbital. The two represents the D orbital. 
And as you might guess here, R3 represents the F orbitals. So again, it's not until we get to the fourth energy level that we do start to see the appearance of the F orbitals start to occur. Once again, we could run through each of the M sub Ls for each of those numbers, and they will come out exactly the same as we did previously, so I won't rewrite them. So if we just did it for the last L value there, which would be three, that would give us an M sub L of minus three, minus two, minus one, we'll go underneath zero, plus one, plus two, and plus three. That is one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven numbers. And each of those basically represent the seven different orbitals in three dimensional space, which means we have our three S, I'm sorry, our four S, our four P, our four D, and I'm not gonna be able to fit them all about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Imagine there's seven of them there. And that is where we see our four F sort of occur uh, on the fourth energy level. <clears throat> so the quantum numbers are really sort of the mathematical representation of wave function and why we say, hey, on the first energy level, there's only an S orbital. On the second one, that's where the P start. On the third one, that's where the D start. On the fourth one, that's where the F start. Much better when they just said, hey, it goes like S, D, P, and all that kind of stuff. Now, what happens when I run out of the letters at this point? What happens if I get an L value of four or five? It actually just goes alphabetical at that point. Yeah. So you just roll alphabetical after F. We never come into contact with any of that in any electron configuration we do. But, you know, if you had an L value of four, what comes after F in the alphabet? Is that G? So that would be G after that, I think. Uh, you just go alphabetical at that point if you actually had more than that. <laughs> Any questions on that there? Clearly, electrons go into the atom, lowest energy first, right? Start filling, go to the next, start filling, go to the next. You can be very specific with your quantum numbers. Like you could pull out an electron from electron configuration, which we will do next time. And you can find the four quantum numbers for that particular electron. So quantum numbers are sort of the basis behind why we have these different orbitals and what energy levels they are on. Any questions on any of that there? All right, we'll lay it up there for today.